Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live music concert. We're here in Wintry, London at Eclectic to offer you an evening of music, of acoustic music, of electronic music, music made with the body, and music mediated through neural networks. Now, the idea of live music might just seem natural, but somehow, with the global pandemic, it's become less natural. And maybe it's at the risk of extinction. So tonight we're celebrating live music from a real space, a real venue for its survival. I'd like to thank Isa and Edouard from Eclectic for making this possible. We're playing through a 13.4 channel surround sound system, the Amina system, of Christian Duca, and all this is then being streamed to you thanks to Bob Rob Hall and B-Side Live. It is full bandwidth surround music. It's going out in ambisonic, so please put your headphones on or turn on that subwoofer that you've got hidden under the sofa. This concert is made possible by the Cultural Recovery Fund by the Arts Council. We also have new funding from the Research Councils of the UK to collaborate with Stanford University in a network music project called Hybrid Live. These are our first experiments, and this event will mark the launch in some ways of a new research center at Goldsmiths, the Center for Sound, Technology, and Culture. So thanks to this infrastructure, this cultural support, we're able to bring you the concert tonight. But without this support, live music of this sort might be difficult and might need help. So if you scroll down on that page, there is a donation button, and please think what you might be able to give. Tonight's program is divided into several parts. We are live here. So with all the delays and wrinkles and hang-ups, we'll try to deliver a concert to you. First on the program is Lucy Stepankova, also known as Ave Sluta, who will present her piece, A Lament for Wooden Bowl and a Handful of Imported Grain. We are going to have a changeover of sets. Unfortunately, you won't be able to join us for a drink. But we'd like to then share with you a reading from a Goldsmiths Press author, Brandon LaBelle, reading a text, Listening to the Body. So we'll have readings in between the sets. I will then perform. I'll probably come back and explain a little bit what I'm doing. And then we'll close the evening with a reading by David Toop, from his book, Inflamed Invisible, a wonderful chapter called Sleep Music. We've had one unfortunate change of program. We had Dane Law to close the evening, and unfortunately, due to conditions of the pandemic and transport, etc., social distancing, all the things we need to respect, Dane cannot be with us tonight. But we hope you enjoy the concert on YouTube Live, Facebook, and the streaming platforms with which you're tuning in now.
In her book, Beyond the Periphery of the Skin, Silvia Federici argues that within today's capitalistic environment, we need to reappropriate the body. She writes, Our struggle then must begin with the reappropriation of our body, the revaluation and rediscovery of its capacity for resistance, and expansion and celebration of its powers, individual and collective. Attending to the body's intrinsic powers is to learn from its languages, its rhythms. As she continues, our bodies have reasons that we need to learn, rediscover, reinvent. We need to listen to their language as the path to our health and healing, as we need to listen to the language and rhythms of the natural world, as the path to the health and healing of the earth. How might we think further about Federici's call for listening to the body? In what sense can the body be listened to? And how might we understand such listening as the basis for countering capitalism's appropriation of the body as a power? And which can also enable greater solidarity or even sympoesis with the natural world? I'm moved by Federici's proposal and the urgency underpinning her understanding of listening. I also feel a sense of urgency for nurturing ways of learning languages of health and healing, and also for inventing new languages, new ways of listening that might afford a greater sense of solidarity, mutuality, collective creativity. In this regard, I wonder if in listening to the body, one collaborates with the body, understanding the body as something that is fundamentally more than myself, and that I must attend to, care for, appreciate, and as Federici says, learn from. Yet, what of the limits of the body, the situatedness of it? Federici seems to suggest that listening enables an emancipatory potential or a power for contending with the social and political structures that orient or exploit the body, that extract from the body and that profit from forms of atomization. Even though the idea of listening to the body suggests a turning inward, a gesture of self-reflection, it feels equally as an act of considering others, listening as a movement, a threading that passes through and across oneself and others. In turning to my body, the body may also turn away, or rather, it turns me toward others, showing the degree to which my body is always more than myself. Listening might be what allows me to recognize this. I also hear this in Federici's call, this sense of the power of the body being a collective, multiplying power, a deep or expansive power, and listening being an act of gaining strength by attuning to that power. I wonder if such strength is founded on that sense of being bound to others, to understand that one is bound to the way others hold us, as well as instrumentalize us, situate us, by way of our skins, our identities, our communities. I'm curious in how the body is stretched, pulled, poked, and made to matter or not, and for different reasons, for different gains. In this way, I'm not sure listening to the body is always leading to an image of togetherness or commingling, as we might think. Rather, it could also be an extremely tough fight to bring awareness to the very fact of being appropriated and instrumentalized. Listening may equally deepen recognition as to the fight ahead, reminding of what little control we have over ourselves. 
This brings us to that sense of the body always being situated and one's listening therefore as being bound to the body in terms of questions of gender, race, class, which necessarily impacts on how I listen to the body and how my body may allow for such listening. Bodies are specific bodies, as we know, and I don't think Federici is suggesting we overlook that fact. Maybe her call for listening to the body as a path toward individual and collective power is more to capture that specificity as the basis for forms of solidarity. Solidarity fostered by listening across and then below the skin, a sort of nature-culture listening, or what Pauline Oliveros also terms quantum listening, as something that is adept at moving across different scales, from the micro to the macro, the imminent to the transcendent. Maybe this is what healing can be in terms of working through one's situatedness and the bonds which support as well as hinder us. muscles. Those, what we call features of the body's signals, are then mapped against some sounds that I've got. And it's a neural network, an artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm that's going to learn different associations between positions of my body and different parts of the sound that I've chosen. After the neural network is trained on a certain number of these associations, we're going to run the neural network and be able to continuously interpolate in a continuous gesture timbre space. So in effect, I'll start with a tabula rasa, an empty neural network, and train it as I play. There will be some moments that are static, some maybe even awkward, but as I chain up different moments, hopefully a smoother and fluid interaction between gesture and sound will emerge. So the first piece, the sounds that are chosen are coming from an old piece for chamber orchestra that I wrote called DSCP. And so this piece is called D-Learn. Thank you. 
So that was Dealer and DSCP, where the original sounds were a chamber orchestra music, chamber orchestra piece that was sliced and diced and put into an information space that's mapped out by timbre, by energy, and all other aspects of metadata in sound. The second piece uses two sources, one for the left arm, one for the right arm, and two neural networks, one for each arm. The left arm then will articulate sounds from a piece of electronic music that I put out called d a track on my Biorhythm CD. And then on the right arm, an excerpt from a live performance by the great musician and composer Michel l o i s v i s who died 10 years ago. He was the artistic director of a studio called Stime in Amsterdam, a studio to whom we owe a lot because those letters, S-T-E-I-M, stood for the Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music. Sadly, with the culture wars and changes in this new century, Stime has had to close its doors. So this is an homage to Michel l Weisfiss and to Stime in a piece called Rapid Regress.
sleep music. Twenty-six letters were sent, not far to travel, from Proust, hypersensitive writer, to his upstairs neighbour, Marie Williams. I was rather troubled by noise. I was trying to sleep off an attack. But at 8 a.m. the tapping on the parquet was so distinct that the veronal didn't work and I woke with the attack still raging. Marie Williams played harp, though it was not the harp that dragged Proust from the fumes of a bedroom armed against asthma attacks, cork-lined to smother noise. Hammerings disturbed him, the banging of carpet fitters, crates nailed shut, Similar disturbances creep into his books periodically. The disagreeable noise of a newly installed heating boiler. A sort of spasmodic hiccup, which nonetheless served on every rehearing to revive images of misty landscapes caught in his memory and studied during the first morning the heater began its work. Proust spoke of an imperceptible breath, like the wind breathing into the stem of a reed, mingling with the subdued song of his dying grandmother's breathing, swift and light, gliding like a skater towards the delicious fluid. The human sighs released at the approach of death, suggesting pain or pleasure in those who can no longer feel. Who, who's there? cries out the old man. Stark terror pulled awake at the faintest of noises from pitch black vicinity of an unseen doorway. Harsh scrape, the tin fastening of a lantern, phantom heartbeat, subdued breath, asphyxiated breath. The interior is dimly lit, utterly dark even. There is one voice or two, whispers of shaping breath thrown into far obscure and occult recesses of the space as if spirits on the wing, whose feathers shriek and keen. They are swans with near-human heads, carrying the lightness of souls, moving between dry land of the living, subterranean rivers of the dead. Sleep music they make, its murmurs written by the method of passive writing. A transcribing of tongues unknown to all but the most open of listeners. To look at animals from an underworld perspective, writes James Hillman, in The Dream and the Underworld, means to regard them as carriers of souls, there to help us see in the dark, to find out who they are and what they are doing there in the dream. We must first of all watch the image and pay less attention to our own reactions to it. The space was a cave, a tunnel, a room without windows, a skull without eyes, ears, nostrils, mouth, though as Beckett had noticed, the soul turns in this cage as in a lantern, silence beating against the walls and being beaten back by them. The space was a chapel, upturned boat, perhaps the Korra that carried Maldun and his crew to the Isle of Weeping, the Isle of Speaking Birds, the Palace of Solitude. Who is there? Is anybody there? A roaring encroaches on the silence 
and voices ascend out of water, wails of grief in Dante's world, no one there to make these sounds. Voices flared in pitch black, spouting flame, buried in deep water they rise up. Within a house described by Mary Butts in Ash of Rings, the bronze note of a clock rings, like a body falling bound into deep water. Can you feel, says the guardian of rings to the woman, now time is made of sound and we listen to it, and are outside it? Have you thought what it is to be outside time? The body descended into the tunnel, never to return as itself.